is Liberty Meet. I'm Kyle Platt here with Grover Norquist. It's such a pleasure to meet you, sir. Hey, good to see you. So you are very famous for your tax pledge, and I'm wondering, it's, it's aimed at GOP members. Do you think that the GOP or the Republican Party is the best way to achieve more freedom in America today? Well, we ask all candidates, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, to take the Taxpayer Protection Pledge. For people who get elected, a lot of Libertarians take it, <clears throat> but don't necessarily win the election. Very few Democrats do because the core constituencies of the Democratic Party live off of spending other people's money. Trial lawyers, labor unions, big city political machines, contractors, government employees. So it's very difficult for a Democrat to honestly take the pledge and keep it. We get a couple. We get a few largely before they lose the next election or switch parties and become Republicans. But we get ivory soap percentages of Republicans. That's good. So while we ask everybody, it is true the Republican Party has collectively made the decision we're the party that won't raise taxes. They may invade small countries they can't pronounce, but they won't raise taxes. Sure. So why taxes? I, it seems to me that you're the kind of individual, of course, being here at Freedom Fest, and from what I know about you, that wants to shrink government, that wants to make government manageable. Why did you decide that taxes and going after taxes was the best way to go about doing that? Sure, because taxes are binary. You raise them or you don't. There's no such thing as a spending pledge. I promise not to spend too much. How would you write that? What would it mean? I promise not to spend any more. Well, with inflation and stuff, the revenues might, you know. Uh, and by the way, the way they spend money in Washington, nobody ever agrees to the top figure. You spend this much, this much, this much. And everyone in Congress can look at you with honesty and say, I was against much of what passed. Okay, if the budget had been sculpted by me, it would be smaller. But they voted for packages that included other people's stuff. There was no way to force votes on what they claim they wouldn't wish to spend it on. So spending is much more difficult to get your hands around in a verifiable way. Now, there's been some rifle shot successes. No more earmarks. That's not a total number thing, but it's a culture. The old culture was people who brought home the bacon, people who brought home earmarks were manly and virile and, and powerful in Washington, D.C. because they could steal other people's stuff, kind of like the larger kid in the kindergarten class. He can steal other people's stuff. He's bigger than the other kids. Um, and that was very corrupting where people were applauding plunder and overspending. With no earmarks, you're no longer judged on that. There's no swimsuit competition. You're going to have to compete on something else, okay? Uh, and that has been very, very helpful in reforming people's attitudes towards spending. Then the Tea Party put spend too much on the agenda in a visceral way, that it wasn't there before. And I would have told you five weeks before it happened that you can't really do that. You can't get people to go to the barricades over spend too much. You have to wait until spend too much becomes a tax increase. Then you can go to the barriers. Um, Prop 13, Proposition 2.5, the Reagan tax cuts. People didn't revolt about spend too much in the previous decade. It was when you tried to raise taxes to pay for spend too much. The American colonists didn't mind Britain spending all that money in the French and Indian Wars. It was when they wanted to raise taxes to pay for them that they got mad. Uh, but maybe because of the size, the rapidity with which it came at people's forehead, the sense that a United Democratic House Senate and President could do and spend anything and there was no limits at all. People did get scared in a way they'd never gotten scared before on spending. So that has changed the tenor, but we still need to figure out ways structurally to rein in spending. Sure. What has happened to the attitude towards the anti-tax activist in America, especially among liberals? When I think of anti-tax activists, the first one I can think of in American history is Henry David Thoreau. Well, I mean, liberals love Thoreau. So why is it that someone like you is such a boogeyman to, to the American left when, I mean, anti-tax crusaders sure. did so uh, to protest wars for, for many great reasons? Um, Thoreau's dead, well. so it's okay to do that. Okay. Uh, on their part, uh, and our friends on the left like wars that breed tax increases because when the war goes away, even if they didn't really like the war, the taxes and spending stay. Remember in 
2003 to 2008, constant drumbeat from the left. We must raise taxes to pay for Bush's wars. Bush should raise taxes. That's what Bush should do. All other wars, people have raised taxes during the wars. The one thing Bush did right, maybe the only thing he did right in his management of Iraq and Afghanistan, was he didn't raise taxes, which would still be paying even as we leave those two places. And two, he didn't put that spending in the baseline. It was emergency supplemental spending, so that when you stop doing it, the total government spending had not been plussed up by $100 billion a year. What the Democrats wanted was, plus up all spending $100 billion a year, have a stupid war if you want for 10 years, then when the war goes away, we get our $100 billion to spend our way, and the taxes to fund it our way. So the Democrats and the liberals have never been against wars particularly. They love war taxes. Then they'd rather spend it in other zones, but if you have to spend it for a few years on planes and things that go boom, that's a small price to pay for access to people's pockets. So one last final question. What is, in your opinion, the ideal income tax rate in America? At the state level, the ideal income tax rate is zero. At the federal level, it should be a flat single rate tax on consumed income, not savings and investment, but consumed income. And we should take it towards zero. And uh, Samuel Gompers, the labor leader, when asked what working people wanted, he said it was more. And my argument of what taxpayers want is lower taxes. 10 years from now, what do we want? Lower taxes. And 20 years from now, what do we want? Lower taxes. And we get down close to zero. We were one of the richest places on the planet uh, before the American Revolution when we were paying 1% to 2% of our income in direct taxes. 1% to 2%. Uh, can we get there? Maybe. We've got to try. 0% sounds good. Grover Norquist, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here. Good to see you. All right. Thank you.